Good morning, everyone. Um, so this session is uh, navigating power, the power surge, trends in data center infrastructure and cooling. Uh, I know earlier today we were talking uh, about what it actually takes to power AI and things along those lines. Uh, and the answer is a lot of power. Uh, it's no easy way to get around. It's a lot of power, it's a lot of cooling, it's a lot of generator, it generates a lot of heat. Uh, when you guys were at our data center facility and we actually powered on some of those machines, you heard how loud it was and you can feel some of that heat coming off of it. That was, I believe, two machines. Uh, so we are act actively now shipping out three to four machines in a single rack. Uh, so not only the heat that's generated, but that power that's generated, we talked about it before, uh, when we were looking at anywhere from 5 to 7 kW uh, kilowatts within a rack, uh, you know, previously, before AI, now we're looking upwards to 50, 100, 150 kW within a single rack that's being shipped. So that's a lot of power. Uh, and with that, that's a lot of cooling that needs to happen. And, and there are different techniques and technologies that we have developed that actually can address that. Um, so with me here, uh, to my left, we have... Of Victor Avalar, he is our he is the chief research ana an analyst for energy management and research center for APC. From Eaton, we have Tony Locker, who is our VP of product marketing, and from Vertiv, we have David Story, who is our tech who is a technical business development manager. To give them all just a couple of seconds, just to introduce themselves and tell them a little about what they do. Sure, uh, my name is Victor Avalar. I'm with a group called the Energy Management Research Center. And we're research analysts looking at data centers, and we're just trying to understand the different technologies to help customers make decisions when it comes to deploying their data centers. Um, this is a, a topic that's obviously been a very important one, and uh, I look forward to discussing it with you. Hello, everyone. Tony Locker. Um, so I'm with the Distributed IT Business Unit within Eaton. So all of our products goes inside the white space, if you will. So the racks, PDUs, UPS. KVM switches, cabling, all that fun stuff. We do everything but the server. So those are the products I'm responsible for. And guys, Dave Story, uh, as, uh, as Jason mentioned, the technical business development. Uh, so I get involved with everything from the power and the cooling. I do a lot of the AI adoption and, and uh, everybody's journey from, you know, just investigating it all the way through, you know, hyperscale deployment. Perfect. So we can just jump into some of the questions that we have here. Um, the first one's for you, Tony. It's how does the rise of artificial intelligence impact data center power consumption and heat distribution? Right. So you mentioned it you know, earlier in the opening there. Um, if you look at, you know, as everyone in the room knows, the AI server has GPUs, which is a much uh, more advanced chip, if you will, and it draws a lot more power than a traditional server, a neighborhood of up to 20 times in some instances. So that has, that's the cause, has a ripple effect throughout the entire power stream, all the way up to uh, the source, if you will. So we were just talking before we came on stage. You know, the state of Virginia does not allow any more data centers. Singapore, same thing. The reason why there's no power availability. So a lot of decisions being made now, where do you put data centers, depends upon where's the power. Um, that was not something that was considered before. When you move down sort of the power stream into medium voltage switch gear, you know, the demand is skyrocketing in the last several years. Lead times have doubled, tripled what they used to be. And that essentially permeates all the way down to the, the uh, power stream down to the racks. So for those who saw the AI servers yesterday, you saw that these are physically larger servers. So now your footprint in the rack has to change um, to accommodate that. Not only that, but they weigh more. So the racks have to accommodate the additional weight. And then you go kind of behind that, the last mile, if you will, in the power stream to the PDUs they now have to distribute two to four times the power that they did before. And these products weren't available the last you know, three to five years. There's been a bit of a technological evolution, if you will, on the PDU side. And that's from all, obviously, manufacturers to be able to distribute this power. And the one thing that we've seen quite a bit, particularly, say, on PDUs and a few other products, you heard earlier the you know, adoption rate of AI, the speed uh, is unbelievable. So right now, where we're seeing is speed is trumping specifications. What I mean by that is you may have had a product that's just close enough in specs. Right now, the customer's saying, I'll take it. I have to get this thing up and running and deployed. So there's a lot more hand-holding from our part than it was before. Um, you talk about the heat dissipation. You know, if you're thinking about you know, just a smaller box, the server, now having 20 times more power going into it, you know, tens of kW into this one box, it's a lot of heat being generated. 
and you have to dissipate it some way, shape, or form. As you mentioned, the sound by the fans, so air cooling, you know, means of the past isn't really going to cut it going forward. So liquid uh, cooling is now starting to be adopted, as you know. So, so really, I guess the, the more of the story is the power and cooling has to be considered early on in the design cycle. You can no longer wait till the end and just throw a UPS or a PDU in place and just have some fancy air cooling. You have to consider it the very first part of your, uh, if you're upgrading your data center or adding a new data center. And then Victor, just building off what he was talking about with cooling, how, what challenges uh, do we see in cooling infrastructure of AI equipment? Yeah, so one of the things that our team does is research and then write white papers. Most of them are published publicly and one of the ones that we wrote um, was white paper 110. So if you search WP110 and throw in se.com, you'll see this paper and it's AI disruption. And the way we looked at it was we said, what are the underlying attributes and trends of AI that affect the physical infrastructure, power cooling and racks? One of those was cooling, but what, one of the things that you, you have to understand is uh, it depends on the workload. One of the attributes to AI is what kind of workload. Is it training or is it inference? If it's inference, you can get away with one or two of these servers in a rack. It really depends on the size of the model and a few other things, but let's say you had to put two servers in a rack, you're okay, you're at 20 kilowatts, you can still air cool it, assuming they're air cooled servers. Okay, uh, what about training? Well, it turns out training is a bit different. Um, why? Because all these GPUs are like neurons and they're trying to uh, communicate with each other. And when you try to communicate with something between two points, you want to lower the latency, right? So what do you do when you're trying to get two servers uh, that are apart from each other to communicate quicker? Reduce the latency. What do you do? You put the servers in the same rack. So you're incented to increase the number of servers in the rack, are you not? The answer is yes. And then what happens when you put a lot of servers in a rack? Now you're up to 100 kilowatts a rack. The latest from NVIDIA is 132 kilowatts a rack. That presents a problem for cooling, as well as power, but if we focus on cooling, there that, there's that other attribute, which is why it's causing you to increase that density, and that is the latency, inter-GPU latency. And so now it's a different problem. Right? Like, you could say, I have an inference server and I can cool it with traditional air cooling. You're good. Then you say, well, I have a training cluster and it's three racks and it's 100 kilowatts a rack. You could probably get away with traditional cooling if you contain that row of racks, those three racks. But then what happens when you're 10 racks? What happens when you're 20 racks? It becomes much harder tr to cool with traditional means. We haven't even talked about liquid-cooled servers yet. If you had a liquid-cooled server and it was an inference server, what would you do? Would you retrofit your entire data center with liquid cooling? No, you would put a radiator on that, uh, in that rack along with that server. And then you're okay because that radiator takes the cool uh, liquid, the hot liquid from your server, blows it out into a radiator, essentially it's a radiator like your car radiator, and then your, your, infra your typical infrastructure uh, rejects that heat. But if you have more than a few of these racks and they're liquid cooled, now you're talking about more disruptive uh, types of infrastructure changes. Not impossible, but you know, think things like a, a coolant distribution unit. So I guess this all to say that it really depends on what you have for a server and how you cool it. It depends on what your workload is and what that latency requirement is. Um, and then we talked about GPU uh, thermal density, but we won't get into that right now. I think that answer suffices. Yeah, and I think one thing that you know you're alluding to that we're going to get to uh, towards the end is uh, planning. It's really coming down to planning not only for now but for the future and figuring out how can you manage all these different technologies uh, at one time uh, currently, and then what's going down in down the line. Is it going to be more of this high compute, or is it going to be less, or how are you going to work it out? Mm -hmm. Um, so we can lead us into our first polling question uh, to the audience, which is, which is, what is your organization's primary challenge with the next generation infrastructure, increased power, and cooling demands? So again, this is a Slido, so if you want to do the QR code, you can actually 
uh, go from there. I think looking at it uh, again is going to be a little more consensus that we can talk about is upgrading uh, your power infrastructure. Um, so again, so David, I would I would like to see if it's possible for you to address this when it comes to updating your power infrastructure within the data center. Yeah, and I, I think Jason, you know, you hit it right on the head, and what everybody's been saying is is planning out the bones of your building and what is feasible is so critical at the onset of any discussion. You know, does it make sense to go to the cloud? Does it make sense to go to a hosted facility? Can you do something in your edge, in your, in your test dev environment? Can you do something in your existing data centers? You know, previously, we'd only typically look at what? The UPS that you have existing. You look at your existing air conditioning, you know, maybe your, your densities to see where you might have some open spots that aren't necessarily so populated. Maybe we're gonna try to put some stuff over there type thing. And we'd retrofit that way. But now when you start talking about some of these numbers, you know, uh, the reference architecture at 132 kilowatts a rack from NVIDIA for the, uh, the inference clusters, we start talking about getting enough power for a traditional data center in just two, three racks. Okay, gosh, you know, what does that mean? Now we have to go look at the switch gear. You know, do we have enough physical power coming to the data room that I don't starve the rest of my building? You know, do I need to bring in additional feeds from utility? depending on how far down you go in the, in the line. Um, you know, we got even some clients that, you know, we were talking about uh, how certain areas you can't even put up a new data center without the concept of BYOP, bring your own power, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so now starting to talk about uh, what they call best systems or battery energy storage systems, things that you can do for long-term battery runtime of different facility level operations so that you can maybe free up some power for the data center or offset some of it, offset the cost from utility. Maybe you create your own microgrid tying in solar and wind and other sustainable sources into a pool of resources becoming your own utility. Maybe that's cheaper than working with your utility today depending on where you're at, where you're looking. So, you know, how do we go ahead and, and look at upgrading our existing architecture? You know, it, it becomes a multiple, multiple discipline endeavor. You know, as IT leaders, you know, you gotta understand where you're going with, with hopefully your vision, with the tools that you're looking to deploy and what you're hoping to gain from them. But then it is a collaborative effort with a partner, with, with your facilities team to go ahead and understand what do you have in the, the uh, building, what the bones are, what the limitations are, and creating a holistic plan to say, you know, what does make sense short-term, long-term, you know? Is the subscription rate in the cloud going to be expensive enough that we need to figure out a new space to build out in a white space in a different location? Do I have some of the overhead that I can go ahead and use it today? Perfect. And then, uh, Victor, I want to skip ahead a little bit and ask you, um, how do data centers balance the need for increased computational power with AI sustainability goals? Because I know that we were talking about before in a keynote, uh, sustainability is something on the top of mind and something that customers are looking to do. Uh, so how do we equate that with what we're looking at now from this AI boom that we're seeing? All right, so sustainability, you could say it's environmental or social or governance, but I, I think we want to focus on environmental um, and to deep, dive a little bit more than it's what's the metric for environmental people tend to think the carbon emissions so if we look at carbon emissions you then say carbon emissions in totality can be broken out into three scopes scope one two and three if you don't know what those are scope one is what you emit on site like a generator scope two is what energy you consume and what energy what emissions come from that energy mostly it's electricity for data centers and then scope three is like supply chain embodied carbon in the ups is in the chillers and the it equipment uh, if you look at a typical data center and where it is, it's generally not in the Nordics where there's like very little emissions from electricity. So I would say start there. If you don't have uh, an electrical source that is renewable or nuclear, um, you might want to buy a power purchase agreement so that you can buy energy uh, carbon credits to reduce that carbon emission. That's that's really the number one place you're like, if you see a pie chart of your data center, that's probably the biggest pie chart 
the pie piece. Um, by the way, that's why we see stories like AWS and Microsoft signing contracts with nuclear facilities. Three Mile Island the is... The opening of Three Mile Island, right? yeah. Crazy, right? Why do you think they're doing that? They, they didn't pick a coal plant. They, they picked a nuclear plant because it's, it's got a very, very low... Uh, really no emissions. The only emissions is when you mine the, the fuel. Um, so it's, it's a smart move if you can get a nuclear plant to, to buy into your idea of building a data center in the backyard. And Tony, what practices do you think we can use to help minimize meeting uh, carbon footprint while meeting performance requirements? Just to tack on. To yeah, just to add on to that, uh, I just read the other day that the cloud, if you will, has a larger carbon footprint than the airline industry. I never would have expected that. That, was, that caught me by surprise. You know, also doing some other research, I noticed that Denmark and Ireland, almost 20% of their total electrical use is for, on data centers. I mean, this is, is a problem today, as you, know, you mentioned, and continues to be so in the future. And you've taught, you hit on renewables. There's other things you can do when you build data centers, low carbon steel, low carbon concrete. That's a lot of talk being uh, you know, discussed on that topic. Um, cooling, about 40% of your typical load, electrical load in data center is on cooling. So anything you do there to improve the efficiency, of whether it's liquid cooling or some other means, that typically falls to the bottom line. Those are the major things. There's some smaller things that most people can control, as I would say, focus your efforts on the smaller things, because those really add up. Um, energy efficiency, whether it be on the IT side, you know, solid state drives or virtualization where you can, some other things. Electrical equipment, you know, higher efficiency UPSs or transformers, uh, just some different ways you could go sort of uh, tackle that. But I would probably start on the smaller side, because that really starts to move the needle. Uh, you actually just triggered a thought. So we have this calculator called the life cycle CO2 calculator, right? Scope one, two, and three, the whole thing, including IT, or you can exclude IT with a little checkbox. But if you go to tools.apc.com, you'll see this life cycle calculator, and you'll see what I mean, that the defaults show up as like the biggest pie piece is energy. But as you alluded to, if you're in the Nordics, that's not your issue. Now it's scope three, and you might want to look at concrete. You might want to look at how much embodied carbon you have in your servers. Because, by the way, that is the biggest embodied carbon piece is the servers. That's no surprise. That's why you built the data center, right? So it, it's a nice tool. It's not a, it's not a high precision tool. It's let me get a rough idea of where I am with my carbon footprint. Perfect. And then, uh, David, just going, just asking you as well, what uh, op opportunities and what uh, things that Vertiv have to help offset or balance, I would say, from a carbon footprint, energy usage standpoint uh, to the cloud and AI. Yeah, I, I think as we go into the world of AI right now, we're, we're such at the bleeding edge that it's not necessarily maximization that we're after, but just how do I, how do I get it to work and, and can I feed the beast, lack of a better term, and then we'll go ahead and, and optimize as we go forward. I think you know one of the biggest things is the transition, and we kind of alluded to this, the, the first level of servers, the you know, H100s, you know, B200, some of these are, are, are still air-cooled, 10 kilowatts a server. Uh, you can get 30-ish kilowatts in a rack pretty easy, still do air cooling. You know, why, why does everybody keep talking about liquid cooling? Why are we jumping over to liquid instead of just continuing down the air path and blowing more and more air at things? It's because liquid has the ability to remove up to, I think the number is 80 to 100 times more energy than air. You know, and that's why we make that transition to the liquid to the chip, right? And that, we're not there as an industry where everything's going liquid to the chip. There's still, if I even go liquid to the chip, still 20% of my heat and my energy is going to be needed to be air cooled. So it's gonna be a blended approach. But if I'm spending 40% of my energy with my air conditioning systems as is today, and they're all air-based, uh, air conditioning, it's traditional refrigerant, uh, the number one thing I'd start looking at is if we're gonna go ahead and expand my air conditioning footprint in any given space, make sure we're looking at chilled water-based air conditioning because that's the most efficient way for the heat rejection out to atmosphere, okay? It might be a little bit more expensive to put it in with pipes and you know, we all have lived through that age of I wanna get liquid out of my data center, no other way around it is coming back in. <laughs> Yes, we got to get used to that, and we have to start building in such a way that we're compartmentalized to mitigate risk, but then also to offset and get the most efficient um, 
thermal transfer going as possible so we can free up our resources to investigate and go down this journey together. And then just touching on that, it's not in the Slido, but just maybe as a show of hands, um, when it comes to AI and thinking of liquid cooling, especially like uh, we were saying before, liquid in the data center, how, how, how does that make people feel? Are you, are you nervous about liquid in the data center <laughs> in general? <laughs> different trades, different trades, come on. Um, so I guess an uh, uh, external question would be, how do, how do customers help get over that fear? Because again, I've never been in a data center where I was just like, you know what, I'll just bring my bottle of water, I'm a little thirsty, I'll just bring it into the data center with me. Um, it's always no water, no nothing, please try your best not to sweat in this data center. <laughs> Um, so how do we help navigate that question? And I, I'll open it up to everybody. How do, we, how do we help navigate those fears that we have? Well, that's Wait. us. Oh, yeah, that's, that's I thought they were right. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ask the audience. Well, I mean, I think it's just a matter of being comfortable with it. And right now, it's kind of the fear of the unknown. You know, it's, we've had water in data centers for many years, decades, in fact, with the chiller plants. It's just that they're in the back room somewhere and only the pipes that come into the data center guess what they were building like big ditches in the subfloor for this event where the steel pipe just cracks and lets a bunch of water out and flood your data center they stopped doing that i don't see too many data centers building that way why because there's a comfort level and these pipes are built in a way that is very resilient and uh, high availability high reliability um, so this is just another, another chapter in bringing liquid closer to the rack. And there are leak detection systems that we've been using for a long time. Um, we don't have the methods of procedures to change a server that is liquid cooled, that don't have pipes on it, right? So we'll have to get used to those procedures. Um, and there are people that know about this in other industries. You just apply those lessons learned to this industry. And I think eventually, it'll be just like we have today. We have cooling units that have big water, four inch water pipes going to it or three inch water pipes going to it. So you don't think about that when you go into your data center today. So I really think it's just a matter of people getting used to it and getting knowledge and then, you know, there are best practices in place that you can, you can um, sleep at night. <laughs> Maybe I could add a little to that. You know, I'm, I'm at the age of my life where I got two kids that are learning to drive right now. And that's a God bless you. For everybody that's in that situation or been through that, you know what I mean? That it's like we know that driving is safe, but until you sit in that passenger seat, you're not too sure what you're getting into. Um, it's okay, you know, and that's kind of what we're going into. Facilities live with water all throughout the, the entire building for since we've started habit, inhabiting buildings. For us, it's different getting near all of our electrical gear, all of our server gear, and trying to get comfortable with those, those nuances. Um, one of the biggest things that you know we're we're getting into is all the different disparate components right you have the air conditioner components that are going outside the building they're ejecting heat to the atmosphere those connect to a chiller plant that chiller plant in turn goes to a separate uh, coolant distribution unit that's the component that that uh, transitions the fluid and creates that private loop in the data center that goes to the chips or to the rear door heat exchangers or anything that's using fluid it's not the same fluid that goes all the way from the outside all the way down to the chip. They do have segmentation for risk and other needs. But when I call that out, the, it's important that you have, you give thought to it so you're not just picking and picking different components and slapping it together. You know, I'm kind of thinking like white box servers, right? You have many different options with memory and, and hard drives and uh, motherboard providers and, and all that. The X factor when you start getting into the liquid is sometimes liquids interact, right? And sometimes metals and piping interact. And so we need to make sure is that if we go down to the chip, that everything in that chain is sustainable and, and interchangeable, and, and you're not gonna have any type of cross-contamination issues going on. That's one of the big things that our entire thermal practice focuses in on, is making sure all the way from atmosphere to the chip, we have that continuity and I'll even say um, there's hydraulic piping that goes to the liquid cooled servers today. That literally they're a compression fitting that goes on to the back of the uh, the two pipes, the hot and the return, uh, the hot return and the cold supply to the back of the servers that are dripless. 
You know, so you can sit there, even though everybody's going to become a plumber from whoever said it over here, it's a very true statement. Everybody's going to get a little plumbing education. You can go ahead and do a quick disconnect there and no fluid is lost to the surrounding environment or if at most a drip, you know. So the risk is very low. It's educating ourselves and getting a little hands-on practice to get familiar and comfortable with it. And I think it's just, it's more of a, of a, of a ghost in our minds versus a true threat if we really get into the details of it. And then just switching gears on one of the final questions before we get to our last Slido, um, is how does in the age of AI, how do data center support a mix that we were talking about before, that mix between legacy technology and new higher compute technology? How does that work? I can, I'll open that up to everybody, and I guess Tony, we can start with you. If. So which is a mix of technology of? Of legacy technology, I would say, and then you know this new high, high compute technology. Because um, the way that I see it, it's, you, even if you're adopting AI, that doesn't really mean that you're getting rid of your legacy servers and things along those lines. It's more of making room, maybe decommissioning uh, older servers that aren't working as properly, putting those on different, uh, s different other servers that are working properly, but then making room for AI as opposed to completely replacing everything with AI. How do customers navigate that? Well, I think that we talked about earlier, just the physical infrastructure changes with the AI servers versus the traditional server. So the physical size is one thing to start to consider. The racks, as I mentioned earlier, have to be bigger, so you have to start to factor that into play. Your power distribution, your busway on top, wherever you distribute the power, that has to be considered as well. So just sort of make provisions, I guess, for AI, because you're right, it's not going to be an overnight swap out. We take everything out, put in the new stuff. So there's going to be a long transition, in my opinion, between the legacy and the new. Um, and perhaps the new is never 100%. There's always going to be some mix between the two. So just make sure you have the provisions. As you mentioned earlier, as you design, you start to think forward to, to consider all the different changes that the AI requires in terms of just the physical size, the power, and the cooling, and try to blend the two, to, all three together. And then our last polling question that we have on the Slido, um, which strategy do you believe your company is trying to introduce in addressing the power and cooling needs of AI-driven driven data centers? Um, I, I, it looks like enhancing uh, air cooling systems is a really uh, a top of mind, and then also adopting liquid cooling, so very much around the cooling portion of it, uh, which I, I think we kind of addressed here, not only, but I, I believe it, it makes a lot of sense uh, coming from, you know, a, an air cooled to a liquid cooled scenario, or even trying to get more of that air cooled in there as much as possible. Um, one thing we didn't really mention, we are running out of time, um, is uh, I would say precision, precision cooling, especially when it comes to air cooled. Um, uh, it does say time's up, but I will leave you with this um, from our panel at least. Uh, when we're talking about infrastructure, this link would actually, this QR code leads you to a free site assessment that we have here at SHI for our customers that you can use. Um, I would use this in tandem actually with the AI readiness assessment so you can figure out what you need from not only an AI perspective, but also a power and cooling perspective to make sure that your AI stack that you're trying to ramp up and put into place actually can be done with what you're doing on-prem to make sure that you can have that. And with that, I'd like to personally thank my panel here um, and as well as all of you for your participation. All right, thank you. Thank you very much.